morning and welcome, and thanks so much for joining us. We are going to continue on with the series we start off summertime now. Can you even remember the summertime with the fall here now? You know, does it feel like summer? Summer's all gone. Summer was never came. I don't know. But we started the series on 1 Corinthians, and actually, believe it or not, in a, we'll be done this uh, pretty soon. Uh, let's recap what we talked about last week, first of all, to make sure we're all on the same page. So last week, we looked kind of a famous passage of scripture in 1 Corinthians. This is the communion passage, right? Remember, it, it's, it's the one that you always hear at communion time, right? You know, Jesus on the night he was betrayed took the bread, right? And we, and we looked at it, but we realized what was actually happening in this passage of scripture wasn't about communion. It was about how people were approaching communion, but also the time together. So we talked, we asked the question last week about what divides us, right? What is it that divides us? And the answer is in our world, in our culture today, everything, everything divides us. There's so many reasons not to like one another. And again, not, this is, is not that this is in culture, but this is actually in the church as well. Christians are having a harder time getting along, shall we say, or playing nicely with one another because we have decided to make central to our identity things that have nothing to do with uh, identity in Christ. So, again, we talked about last week, right? If, is, it, is it vaccines? Is it masks? Is it politics? Is it race? Is it gender? Is it, like, what is it that separates us? These are all the classifications that culture uses. But what we realized is, is that this is not what really what, what we're supposed to uh, live and think like as Christ followers. And so what Paul was saying to the church in Corinth is that, hey, when you guys get together, first of all, try not to get drunk which, by the way, is kind of a different way of approaching communion for sure. But the other thing we found out, though, and we talked about this last week. So remember, one of the things we have to remember when we're looking at the church in Corinth is that it is set in the first century Rome. And so remember, in first century Rome, what would happen is you would have kind of the place where the special guests are, and then you'd have the atrium, or you'd have the lobby as we would have here. And what was happening is the poor and the slaves were being out in the, in the, in the lobby being served either nothing or very little, while the special guests were getting the good wine and the meat and the food. And Paul was just appalled that the body of Christ would, would, would separate itself along such demo, uh, demographic lines. Right? So what he was saying to them is that, you know, you're actually doing more harm than good. And we looked at this one passage of scripture in verse 26 where he says this, For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. And what Paul was saying here with this idea of announcement, even though Greek word for announcing is, is like, actually it's funny, we sang it this morning, right? Go up on the mountaintop and scream your head off. Now, we live in Ontario, so it might just be a tall hill, right? So we don't really have that. I don't really recommend you going on top of a tall hill and screaming, although I think that'd be funny and definitely YouTube that. But uh, what he's saying is basically we proclaim how we treat each other. You know what's interesting about cr being a Christ follower? What we, how we act and behave always underlines what we believe. So if we actually believe that we're made in the image of Christ, if we actually believe that we are, we are worthy of dignity and, and, and love for each other, but we don't behave that way, right? There's this comedian who used to use a phrase when people have this, this, this really bad disconnect. He used to say, stupid or liar, right? Either you're ignorant of what the Bible is saying or you're lying to yourself and trying to modify it in what it is. And that's exactly what Paul is saying to the church in Corinth. He's saying, listen, we've talked about this. We've talked about how you're supposed to be together. And remember, I can't imagine a church where you would have slaves and slave owners. So for us Westerners, us North Americans, that's, a, that's an appalling uh, description. Like, like, can you imagine being a slave and being a person who'd work like seven days a week and you are owned body and soul by a person? And again, that horrifies us. And again, rightfully so, it should horrify us. But how does that individual and a slave come together? Well, the beautiful thing is that it can't actually happen in Christ if you don't look at, the, at, at that label. But if you live as a culture, then you do look at that label and go, well, this is why we're, we're separated. And finally, we looked at this uh, wonderful passage in, uh, in uh, Philippians when Paul says the church in Philippi. He right, says, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ, any comfort from his love, any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Like, I, like, I feel like this should be the battle cry of the church today. Right? Like, I've said this before, and I'll just say it again. The pandemic was a missed opportunity for the church. Just flat out. 
We acted and behaved exactly like culture. Therefore, culture has dismissed us and has continued to, to, to dismiss us. Why? Because we are allowing culture to define who and what we are. So that's what we talked about last week. This morning, we're going to kind of get to the fun stuff. So 11 chapters have gone by, and Paul has really kind of, uh, he's really, I don't want to say nitpicked, but he's really kind of correcting the, the church in Corinth, and rightfully so. They are, they are just appalling in their behavior. But now he's going to start reconstructing, and the, next, the last part of the book is going to be part, okay, so here's what you're doing wrong, right? But now let's talk about what we can do right. And so this morning we're going to take a look at that. But before we get that, there's a great article by a name Sam Hunter talking about the missing link. And no, not an evolutionary missing link, but this idea of the missing link in the church. And this is what he says. What if you had never met any Christians and had never attended a Christian church? All you had was the Bible. You had the read the Old Testament and saw the Spirit moving among the unformed earth. You had witnessed the Spirit moving uh, into and away from various characters in the Old Testament stories. You had seen both Samson and King Saul move mightily with the Spirit. And you had seen the Spirit leave them as they continually grieved him. Then you get to the New Testament, and at John's Gospel, you hear Jesus' promise of a new power, a power that will never leave you. You read on, watching as this promise of power plays out so obviously throughout the apostles' lives. You can't help but think, whoa, this Holy Spirit must be something else. You know what's interesting? Is we ask ourselves, how much does the Western church look like the biblical church? Now, please understand, I am not talking about methodology. Right? Uh, it's one interesting thing is that, you know, as Christ followers, we realize that there are different denominational backgrounds. I've talked about this before, whether it's Catholicism, mainline, whether it be more of a charismatic, more Baptistic, you know, reform, whatever you might be. There are different methodologies. That's not what we're talking about, right? Because whether it's, it's a, I, I have met some Catholic individuals who are more spirit-filled than some Pentecostals. I have met uh, uh, people from uh, Orthodox tradition that are more biblically literate than people in a Baptist, uh, right? So we don't really lose denominations as this catch-all, like, this is who we are. So we go, okay, but what he's really talking about is apart from the denominational schisms, splintering, underlying that, if all you had was the Bible, and you actually ask yourself, does what we do or look like at the church reflect this document? And I think that's actually a really great question. He goes on to say this, now, after a time, you're going to go get the opportunity to visit America. Of course, so is America. Uh, but I think Canada falls in this category as well, too. For the first time, and for the first time to meet these Christians you've been reading about. What will it be like, you think to yourself? Will they be superhumans, giants? Will they stand out at every crowd, shining like the sun? Of course they will. That's the promise. It's right there throughout the New Testament. It's everywhere. This promise, this power. It's what happened to all those who placed their saving trust in the guy Jesus I've read about. Right, so when we look at the New Testament, we look at the book of Acts, and we look at the letters onward, we do see behavior that's, of course, appalling. But we also see this stuff as well, too, that goes on about Christ followers really being transformed and, and living by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, he's asking the question, like, what would that be like if we actually encountered the church? And finally, he says this. Uh, most of us, the vast majority of us, live lives that look just like everyone else around us. You live with anxiety and uncertainty and fear. Some have more anxiety than others, but no one escapes this and their own power. And some of you are in complete denial of this. My life is good. What are you talking about? But oh, come on. Deep inside, you know something is missing. You know there's more. There's got to be. What is missing for us, for many of you, is simply the Holy Spirit. For many others of you, it's the power of the Holy Spirit. We've talked about this at UCC, and, and, and I actually did a series on this back in the spring, and going to be stealing a little bit for that this morning. But the truth is, when we think about the church, we think about what it means to be a Christ follower, what we have to realize is we are in the age of the Holy Spirit, right? So actually, it's funny. I, um, uh, I actually it was going through the process of being ordained for the third time uh, in, in the Alliance, right? Because I'm new to the Alliance, so I have to go through the process again. And uh, so I was having my, my final ordination interview uh, this past week. It was via Zoom. And uh, one person asked me, so like, tell me about your doctrine of the Trinity. I said, fair enough. So here's, a, here's what it looks like. I said, so in the Old Testament, we meet God the Father, right? That's what we call God. That's what the Hebrews would call Yahweh, right? And God the Father gives us this idea of holiness, right? Because he gives us the law. He tells us what is right and what is wrong, and he gives us boundaries. However, in the Old Testament, there are these glimpses of 
this, this other person called the, the um, uh, you know, what we call Christophany, but there's also the Spirit of God, right? Matter of fact, in Genesis, the first part of the Trinity that we meet is the Spirit of God. He's hovering amongst the waters. So we move to, but, but it's God the Father front and center. Then we get to the Gospels, and it's God the Son. Jesus steps forward, right? But the Father and the Spirit are in the wings, right? And, and finally, we get to the book of Acts. And the book of Acts, God the Spirit steps forward, and, and the Son and the Father are in the wings. Not to say that one is, is superior to the other. It just simply means one is more active. Now, the reason why that's important is because we are in the age of the Spirit, right? We are in the age of the Holy Spirit empowering, filling, and transforming us. But the fact is, it doesn't really feel like that. Hudson Taylor, uh, an uh, an old missionologist, uh, one of the individuals who was, uh, you know, very instrumental in missionizing uh, parts of the world, says this about the Holy Spirit. Since the days of Pentecost, has the whole church ever put aside every other work and waited upon him for 10 days, that the Spirit's power might be manifested? We give too much attention to method and machinery and resources and too little to source of power. It's one of the things we talk about here at UCC, right? We say this all the time, and it's something I'm trying to uh, help you understand who we are as a church. And, and we at Uptown Community Church, we've made some really bizarre uh, decisions. And one of those decisions are that we are not here to entertain you, and you're not here to perform. Now, the reason that's bizarre is because most churches today have decided that the performance of the Sunday morning is more important than actually what's taking place. Now, even as I say that, I also just want to say that, like, I don't mean to say that churches aren't valid and all that, but it's just, when you look at budgets, when you look at where the resources and the attention goes to, it's kind of the, the big show of Sunday morning, right? At UCC, we, we, we've decided not to do that because, A, I just, it's not really what's, what's part and parcel to the gospel. So as a pastor, I remember hearing people say things like this, and they don't know what they're saying or the implications of it, but, like, they'll say stuff like, oh, you know, did you, hear, see, did you listen to that new worship album? Or, or, or are we going to do that new song that just came out last, you know, five hours ago that everyone should know? Or, 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 you know, like, I went to a worship conference, and man, did I worship there. And, and at church, I just can't seem to worship like that. It's, a, it's an idea we talk about spiritual karaoke, right? It's this idea where, you know, if you go to a karaoke bar, you wait, you wait to your favorite song, and then you sing along. Well, the appalling thing about the Western church is we've, we've become that. Oh, I'm not going to worship if they don't sing my song. Oh, I'm not going to worship if it's not this type of song or, or they have this type of level. Or if anything goes out of place, I'm not going to worship. Right? You, you, you understand why this is kind of a, and I use this as, 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 as closely I can to it. It is a grotesque understanding of worship and how God would, ap- would approach. And so when we talk about the Holy Spirit, it's really kind of interesting because when we talk about this, we talk about it in an abstract way, but it actually has practical implications. So every week we talk, we start off by asking a question. And the question I'm going to ask you this morning, the question I want you to think about, because Paul is going to bring this up, is the question is this, what's your spiritual gift? If I said to you, what is your spiritual gift? What would your answer be? Would it be, uh, I, I didn't actually think I didn't even have one or I'm waiting for it to happen, or that's somebody else's job. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Before we jump into 1 Corinthians 12, let's talk about the four characteristics, the four things that the church in Corinth are wrestling with, right? Corinth is sensual, right? Remember, Corinth is a very sensual culture. It's Las Vegas of the ancient world. Corinth is immature. Remember, by the time Paul writes 1 Corinthians, it's only been three years have passed since Paul has left. So they're still immature in that way, but they're really immature in many ways as well, too. Corinth is struggling with transformation. Continually, Paul comes back to them and says to them, listen, like I'm coming back to you. I'm going to come back to you because you guys have kind of forgotten what I've taught. And finally, Corinth is trying to blend the gospel and the culture. Corinth is trying to say, listen, let's make sure we get out there to tell people who we are, but let's make sure they like us as well, too. Let's be the cool Christians. Let's be the hip, happening Christians. Let's, let's make sure that we're that, that type of people so we can, we can be attractional and get people to our church. So 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, verse 1, Paul starts off with this. He says, Now, dear brothers and sisters, regarding your question about special abilities the Spirit gives us, I don't want you to misunderstand this. Pause. A couple of things you need to understand here, and we're going to unpack this a lot, a lot more, but one of the things that Paul is assuming is this. Each one of you when you became a Christ follower, you were given spiritual gifts. Now, the interesting thing about that is no one asked you what you wanted. 
no one tapped you on the shoulder like, hey, you're an extrovert. Maybe you should do this. Or, hey, you're an introvert. Maybe you should do this. Or, hey, you have this much resources or you don't have that resources or whichever way you look at it, right? But the Spirit is actually, what Paul is saying to the church in Corinth, which he's saying to us today as well, is that the Spirit gives, bi- uh, the Spirit gives it to us, to all of us. He doesn't, he doesn't say, well, to some of you, right? The good Christians or, or, or this type of Christian, right? He says to all of us. Now, a couple of things about this before we kind of continue. Ray Steadman, in his commentary on this, is kind of interesting. He says, you will recognize that when we start talking about spiritual gifts and the functioning of the body, we get into the areas that are highly subjected to discussion and controversy and disagreement. Whenever we talk about the Holy Spirit, it's always interesting to me how people say, well, that's, hey, pastor, because you're, you're, you're a former Pentecostal, that's why you're obsessed with the Spirit, right? Now, that might be true, but I think there's more to it than that, right? Um, Dr. Michael Heiser says this, many Christians do claim to believe in the supernatural but think and live like skeptics. We find talk of the supernatural world uncomfortable. This is typical of denominations in evangelical congregations outside the charismatic movement. What's interesting is that um, as a Pentecostal, and there are other neo-charismatics uh, like myself, we were obsessed with the Holy Spirit to the point where we forgot about the other two parts of the Trinity. But the vast majority of people would not be Pentecostal or neo-charismatic, and they would be in the first two parts of Trinity, Father and Son, but the Holy Spirit would be kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of weird. And to be honest with you, when we talk about theology, the doctrine of uh, the Holy Spirit and pneumatology, there are some squishy edges to it. I want to be honest with you about that because there isn't a c- precise theology of the Holy Spirit. Uh, there is in, in the core, but when it gets to the edges of it, you're like, well, is it for me? Or is it for anyone? So what we tend to do is we just kind of ignore it. But what's interesting is, is in the early church, this was also the problem. So in Acts chapter 8, we see that, um, that uh, Samaria accepts the gospel, but they accept Jesus, but the Spirit hadn't come upon them yet. Now, understand something. I can't explain to you the theological implications of this. I just can't. How is it that people can accept Jesus, but not the Holy Spirit? I don't know, actually. Well, actually, that's, that's not a lie. I kind of do know, because it's kind of the church today. We see, we love Jesus because we can leave, look at Jesus as, you know, the Mr. Rogers of the Bible, right? This guy walks around with a, with a, a lamb around his shoulder, Right? Like, that's, that's the Jesus we look at, right? But when it gets to the Holy Spirit, we're kind of like, well, I don't, I, I'm not 100% sure. But it's even worse by Acts chapter 19. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul took uh, the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. I would say to you that this is the Western church today. Right? Like, if we truly believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, then will we use so much of our resources to live and act and behave as if the Spirit didn't exist. It's an uncomfortable conversation that pastors don't want to have a talk about because, again, churches are more attractional. Why? Because every church is competing for the same amount of people to get butts in the seats. And hopefully some of those butts in the seats will put money in the, in the plate. Right? That, that's really kind of, the, the, kind of the, 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 the idea behind it as well, too. And so in the early church, this is also a problem, but I'd say it's a problem today. So let's go back to chapter 12, and let's look what Paul says. Verses 2 to 3. You knew that while you were still pagans, you were led astray and swept along in worshiping speechless idols. So I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God will curse Jesus, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, two things here. Led astray, swept along. Right? Led astray is you are following an individual Swept along as you just don't care. Where, whatever the crowd's doing, whatever I'm also doing, I'm going to do that as well too. And when it comes to this idea of the uh, doctrine of the Holy Spirit, this can be happen to us, right? We can just go, oh, well, this influencer or this celebrity Christian or, or this famous pastor or, or whoever it might be, I'm going to follow them. Or whatever else is just everyone's doing, right? Whatever else is just doing. And the swept along, I think it's kind of interesting because it's, it's more of the uh, whatever culture is okay with, that's what we're going to do with, as well too. Now, let's go on to verses 4 to 6. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but is the same God who does, does the work in all of us. See, part of what I'm trying to emphasize to you, and we're going to unpack this a little bit more, 
is when we talk about this idea, when I ask you the question, what's your spiritual gift? You don't get to say, I don't have any. Because oftentimes, that's what people say. And I would also say to you, you don't get to say, I don't know. Because whether it's, <laughs> not saying you're stupid or a liar, but ignorance or, or, or you know, being led or, or, or going along with, I don't know, it's not really acceptable to Paul. Right? He's, not, he's not going, well, this is okay. You're, you're allowed to be about this. And finally, before we kind of unpack this a little bit more, verses 7 and 11. It says this, a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. It is a one and only spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. Just want to emphasize something here. Paul doesn't say to some of you. I hope you're really getting that emphasis here. Paul is just making the assumption, and rightfully so, based upon a fully fleshed out understanding of the Holy Spirit, that all of us are given a gift or gifts of the Spirit. And we'll unpack this a little bit more. So, what we have to ask ourselves is what is really happening here and how do we as a church look at this? N.T. Wright has a great uh, uh, quote on this. He says this, The task of the church cannot be attempted without the Spirit. I have, I have sometimes heard Christian people talk as though, having done what's done in Jesus, God now wants us to do our part by getting, a, a getting on with things under our own steam. But that is a tragic misunderstanding and leads either to arrogance or to burnout or both. Without God's Spirit, there is nothing we can do that will count for God's kingdom. Without God's Spirit, this church simply can't be the church. And I think uh, Dr. Wright is absolutely correct here. Without the Holy Spirit, whatever we do on a Sunday morning, whatever you do throughout the week, it's nothing. It means nothing. It is nothing. And again, in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul says it's garbage. Without the Holy Spirit, whatever you do for the kingdom is garbage. You're like, wait a minute, what? Are you talking if I don't, if I, if I, like, no, no, you don't understand. Whatever the Spirit wants to do in you, he wants to, he wants to, he wants to magnify your own small desires and make them, uh, make them writ large. Now, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, a lot of times people don't even know what the Holy Spirit does. I've taught on this before, and for those of you who've been part of UCC, you'll see some repetition here, but I think it's important to make sure we all come back to the same page. When we talk about the Holy Spirit, when I talk to people about the Holy Spirit, I say to them, well, what's the Holy Spirit supposed to do? And they're like, I don't know. Chase me around with a tongue of fire, uh, make me speak in tongues, uh, float in the sky. I don't know, right? Like, oftentimes when we think about the Holy Spirit, we think of stranger things, right? And we're kind of like 11, right? We're like, well, not the shaved head part, but we're like, ah! right? Like, we want to we wanna move something, do something, or we want to be that freaky chick floating in the sky, and again, spoiler alerts if you haven't seen Stranger Things. But you get the idea, right? When we talk about the Holy Spirit, a, a lot of misunderstanding of what the Holy Spirit does. But the fact is, Jesus gives us a very clear picture of what the Holy Spirit is supposed to do. So the first thing the Holy Spirit does is the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin. John chapters 14, 15, and 16 is Christ's high priestly teaching on the Holy Spirit. So if you ever want to know what the Holy Spirit does, just read John 14, 15, and 16. And we'll get to that towards the end. But in John chapter 16, verse 8, Jesus says this, And when he comes, the Spirit, he will convict the world of sin and of God's righteousness in the coming judgment. So if you understand it this way, the Holy Spirit takes a person who is not yet a Christ follower, and he wants to impress upon that individual their need for Jesus. Many of you have come to me and said to me something like this. There's somebody in my life who doesn't know Jesus. You know, a family member, a spouse, uh, a, a friend, whatever, whoever it might be. And the question you asked, ask me is this. Well, how do I convince that person about, to follow Christ or, or to accept Jesus? And my response to you is, you can't. See, oftentimes people think to themselves, if I just had the right answer for the question they ask, then they will fall to their knees and accept Jesus. I don't know how to say this in a way that's, that's really nice, but... Being a pastor for like over 25 years and having studied and, 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 and read and all that, I have yet to meet an individual that was going to give me a reason not to believe in Jesus that I can't really have a conversation with. But do you know what's interesting? Is even after I have a conversation with an atheist, an agnostic, someone of a different religion, or just even an apathetic Christian, you know what they never seem to do? Fall to their knees and accept Jesus as Christ. 
See, you believe that following Christ is a cognitive assumption. If I just had the right answers. Right? And some of you said to me, I don't want to share my faith because I don't have the answers. What if they ask me this? What if they ask me that? Pastor, I don't have the answer. Why? Because you make the wrong assumption. You believe that following Christ is only in your mind. Mind and heart for sure, but what is the catalyst for that? It's the Holy Spirit. What I have said to you before and what I continue to say to you is that if there's somebody in your life that you want to accept Christ or you want them to experience Jesus, release the Holy Spirit upon them. Well, how does that happen? Do I walk around with like a super soaker full of oil and just keep hitting them at it? That would be funny. YouTube that. Please don't tell me you're part of our church. But uh, no, it's simply every morning when you pray for the individual, just say something like this. Holy Spirit, today, speak to their hearts. Speak to their minds. Break through the barriers. Just, just whisper, scream, shout, whatever it might be, Spirit of God. And do this consistently. Now, just because I say to you do consistently doesn't mean they're going to have an aha moment. But I guarantee you one thing. You're closer to them having an aha moment than you were with you having the answer. So... What the Spirit wants to do is he wants to take those who are not part of the body of Christ, not in the kingdom of heaven, and move them towards that conviction. The second thing. Uh, I had a passage of scripture from uh, John chapter 14, but I think this one in, in 2 Corinthians works out even better. It says this. Uh, the next thing the Holy Spirit wants to do is he wants to transform us into Jesus. So all of us who have had the veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. See, one of the things that I was taught as a Pentecostal is the most spirit-filled person speaks in tongues. I remember as a teenager when I didn't speak in tongues, I didn't think I was a very spiritual person. Why? Because I didn't speak in tongues. That, because that was the pinnacle of Holy Spirit uh, power in my context. And I remember, <laughs> this is probably... This is probably more of a therapy session than anything else. We would get called to the front as youth to get to, to speak in tongues. And you'd have a, a speaker or, or, or somebody lay hands on you, and they would pray that you speak in tongues. And they would, oh, my gosh, I can't even believe they did this stuff. They would tell you just, oh, okay, I don't even want to say it. But they would, they would try to encourage you to, anyways, to, to talk gibberish so that it, it would just, you would start speaking in tongues, right? And I remember going to the front because I thought that this is what a, a spirit-filled person did is you had to speak in tongues. So I'd go to the front, you'd close your eyes, and, and you'd wait for the person, they'd come and put their hands on your head, and they'd say, okay, uh, Holy Spirit, make them speak in tongues. And the funny thing about that is I had never heard anybody say, hey, Holy Spirit, make them more like Jesus. See, that was a part that we had missed is the most spirit-filled person resembles Jesus. And so what's interesting about the Holy Spirit is, is that the two functions of the Spirit really aren't as abstract, spooky, Casper the Friendly Spirit, is that you know what the Spirit does. First, it takes a person, moves him into the kingdom. And once he's moved him into the kingdom, then he starts cleaning them. Then he starts transforming them. That's the process we call sanctification. But that's what it is, right? And so what happens is, is because we make the Holy Spirit so weird and spooky and kind of supernatural, we think to ourselves, well, there's no actual practical application. Oh, but there is. See, every day that you're a Christ follower, every day that you assume the lordship of Jesus upon your lives, little by little, maybe sometimes large by large, you become like Jesus. Your reactions to the culture become like Jesus. Your reactions to brothers and sisters become more like Jesus. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. We have churches full of people who don't look like Jesus. And in the pandemic, that was even, that was doubly, quadruply, I don't know, whatever the double app, uh, app that is, but it was so made obvious where we had Christians who had just, we, they were spiritless. How could you be spiritless is when you attacked other Christians. What does Paul say? A person who has the spirit in them cannot say Jesus is not Lord. Well, how do you do that? It's when you look at another brother and sister in Christ, and you say, because of your preference, because of your methodology, you don't have Jesus like I have. That's not what the Spirit does. Now, two things you need to understand about the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is triggered by need. Comfort resists the Spirit. I've told you this before, but let me unpack this. One of the reasons why our churches are, 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 are very spiritless is because the church is, like, like, if the Holy Spirit doesn't show up, A.W. Tozer has this fantastic quote. He says, you know, if the Spirit of God doesn't show up, churches would continue to go on as if nothing had changed. 
and he's absolutely correct, right? So what's happening is that, you know, you know what's always funny to me is that uh, if you've ever been in a service where a missionary comes from another country, right, and they tell you stories about what they're experiencing in that context, and many of them are miraculous and, and it's incredible, and you say to yourself, you think to yourself, why does that not happen here? I thought that. Uh, you know, a missionary would come back, well, yeah, I wandered to this village, and this demon came out, and I told him to go away, and the entire village became Christ followers. You're like, can I do that to my professor or my boss? Can the, is, is that a possibility? Can I do that to my next-door neighbor? Can I do that to my spouse? Like, like, can, like can I do that to my friends? Like, why does that not happen here? The Spirit is triggered by need. We don't need the Holy Spirit, therefore we don't depend upon the Holy Spirit. It's not a big shock, really. I remember when I was in Uganda, we, we visited this woman. She's part of the church. L- we had to travel through a long way without roads. to this, this, this literally this trail through the forest. We get to her hut. It's exactly what you would imagine. It's like uh, grass on the top. And it's round. She comes to the door, but spilling up from behind her comes like seven grandkids. These grandkids are like her, 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 her sons and daughters. Some of them have passed away. It's her job now to raise them. She has no job. She lives in the middle of the forest. She's got seven children. And again, they all seem like the age, uh, under the age of five. Uh, and, and, and so I'm sitting there. I'm staring at her. And I'm like, well, wha- <laughs> how do you survive out here? Right? And so the pastor was translating. He's talking. And, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm standing next to him. And again, my, oh, my, my jaw's on the ground there. And she just says the most simplest thing. It's, it's as if this is just the most obvious truth. I just, I just pray and have faith. Just so you know, that's a horrifying concept. I just pray and have faith. What, what kind of craziness is that? Like, go, like, do something. Like, I don't know. Like, do something. And literally, she says, like, I, I got to take care of these seven little ones. What can I do? I can't go to work. Who's gonna, I don't want, there's not daycare. And I get it. But you know what she said? Every day, without fail, something happens where the God provides for me. The fact that your church is here, your, your, your youth and it was our, our team, we brought like, we brought, like um, uh, mattresses, we brought food, we brought water, we brought jugs, we brought like, like just everything. And when the food we brought her would last her like, like, like a, I think about a month thereabouts. She's like, every day God just takes care of me. And I gotta tell you, that terrifies me. Right? It just terrifies me because it's like that, that type of dependence, that type of faith is just something that's just like, I, I, I'm just confessing this as your pastor. I, I, like I, what? How does it, how do you, like, and I, I almost felt like, sir, can you pray for me, please? Because, you know, I'm a professional Christian. I don't know what to do. Can you just pray for me that I would have your type of faith? But you know why she has that faith? She's got nothing else. She's got nothing else. Like, and again, I think to myself, What? But the second thing about the Holy Spirit is comfort resists the Spirit. See, one of the things you have to understand about the Holy Spirit is whatever He wants to do in your life to transform you, it's absolutely outside of your comfort zone. You have been out in the world and you have felt the prompting to do something. You just dismiss it. Well, that's crazy talk. I would never go up to a person and say that. I would never do that. Or I would. Comfort resists the Spirit. So you see this, this kind of vicious circle we have in the Western church. Spirit is triggered by need. We don't have any needs around us, therefore we don't need the Spirit. And we're very comfortable. So we, don't, we, just, don't, we just don't need the Holy Spirit. And because of that, we are in this, this, this vicious cycle of kind of a spirit, spiritless church. So when we talk about the Spirit, we have to really break it down to two classifications, right? Because when I'm talking about the Holy Spirit, we have to separate how Paul breaks it down. So you know this passage, and I'm not going to spend too much time on it, right? The fruit of the Spirit. And there's actually songs you can sing about this, right? You know, the fruit of the Spirit, are blah, 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 right? You know the song, right? But see, the problem with the fruit of the Spirit and the list of the fruit of the Spirit is you actually miss the point of what's important about this passage. And the point is the fruit. It's not the naming of it. Because people, you know, one of the things we, we do wrong within the Western church is we classify everything, we label everything. So we do this thing where we're like, oh, what's, what's your fruit of the Spirit? Joy, peace, patience. Introverts are like, I'm not talking. I don't know. Like, uh, like uh, whatever it is. Like we go, no, this is the fruit of the Spirit. We look at this list and we go, you know, these are the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Just so you know, 
These are not the fruit of the Spirit. There are more. But Paul just lists these ones. People go, well, no, these, these don't. No, it, it, it's not. I'll, I'll show you why. The point that we miss in this passage is there's fruit. Now, we've talked about this before, but I just want to remind you something. Throughout the Bible, Jesus uses this idea of fruit as a really important thing. The thing is this. Fruit is an indicator of a healthy Christ follower. See, we look at the fruit and go, love, joy. Like, that's not the point you need to understand. The point is, is that consistently when Jesus talks about it, we prove that we are followers of Jesus by our fruit. Now, what's interesting is, is that in Matthew chapter 7, for example, Jesus lays this up very, very clearly. See, this is the part that Christians get really uncomfortable with, right? And people go, well, are you saying that, you know, we have, we have to have works for our salvation? Are you, are you talking about, like, no, I'm not. But what I am saying is that when we fully let the Spirit take a hold of us and we fully get ourselves into Christ and, and accept the Lordship of Him, something happens. So what does Jesus say? Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, 16. You can identify them by their fruit. That is, by the way they act. Isn't that kind of interesting to think about? That you should be able to, if you walk into a room of Christ followers, something about them should be different. I don't want to say fruity. But something should be different about them than everybody else. Look what he says in verse 17. A good tree produces good fruit. A bad tree produces bad fruit. I think we can all go, yeah, that makes sense. But now look at verse 19, 20. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, you can identify people by their actions. Fruit or crops are a marker of an authentic disciple of Jesus. The inverse being true as well. Now what's the inverse? If you are fruitless in your faith, in your Christ, in your, in your Christianity, I would say to you that something might be wrong. If you are not producing any fruit in your life, there might be something wrong. Now, let's talk about the fruit of the Spirit, right? So when we talk about the fruit, here's a couple of things I need want you to understand. The growth of the fruit is gradual. It's not like you become a Christ follower, boom, you just got everything. It is not. It's a lifelong goal. The growth of the fruit is inevitable. In other words, if you're connected to Christ, it's going to happen. And you want know to love about it? It's going to happen whether you want to or not. The growth of the fruit is internal. And we'll unpack this a little bit more in a second. But when we talk about the fruit of the Spirit, this is the internal transformation, the love, joy, the peace. Like, it's internal. And finally, the growth of the fruit is symmetrical. They all grow together. It's not like one day, whoo, I got an apple today. Ooh, I'm hoping tomorrow for a mango. Right? It's, it's like almost like a video game, like Mario. We keep collecting these, you know, these fruit and all that. That's, that's not really how it works. Right? They're all working together. Why? Because the Spirit is seeing what is, what is broken in us, what is dark, what is, what is contrary to the kingdom. And he's trying to change us. Now, let's get to the gifts. And, of course, we saw this in 1 Corinthians 12. But let me just kind of emphasize this a little bit. Now, about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be uninformed. To their one is given through the Spirit uh, a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still to another the interpretation of the tongues. Now, what's interesting about the gifts list, there are three gifts lists, gifts lists in the Bible that Paul talks about. Now, if you believe that Paul is being very specific about the gifts, then what you will say is that these are the only gifts of the Spirit that, that the Spirit gives. But the problem is when Paul talks about it again another time, oh, I don't know, like say Romans chapter 12, verse 6 to 8, the lists don't align. He mentions some here, but he mentions different ones there. Why would Paul do that? Is Paul, is Paul not smart? Is Paul like just making this up as he goes? Kind of. Because this is the squishiness of the Spirit. See, one of, the, one of the problems about the, when we talk about the gifts of the Spirit are that people go, oh, I, I, don't raise your hand, but how many of you have taken a spiritual gifts test? Don't raise your hand. Good moment to make fun of you. Um, you cannot take a spiritual gifts test. You know why? You can't quantify the Holy Spirit that way. Whenever you take a gifts test, all you're testing is your interests or your affinities. What did I say to you before? The Holy Spirit works outside of your comfort zone. It's easy to do what you're good at. It's easy to do what you like. It's easy to do what you want to do. It's a far different conversation to have what the Spirit wants to do in you. 
So you can't take a gifts test to determine your spiritual gifts. And do you know why you can't take a gifts test to determine your spiritual gifts? If the Holy Spirit is need-oriented, wherever you go throughout your life, you're going to encounter different needs. Could you imagine being out in the world and you think to yourself, well, my spiritual gift is, uh, I don't know, speaking in tongues. So you, you encounter somebody who needs food or needs money or needs whatever. I'm sorry, my gift is speaking in tongues. I can speak in tongues over you, but I can't give you anything. That sounds kind of bizarre, doesn't it? Just, if you're not thinking that's not kind of bizarre, then I, I, it's, that's bizarre, right? But I know in my past as a pastor, I have had people say to me, well, pastor, I, I, I just can't help out. That's not my gift. And I feel like saying to them, you know, it's, you know what's really, you know what's great about me? I have an inside voice that really makes it to the outside. I know you say to yourself, well, the outside voice must be terrible. No, the inside voice, the things I think in my head, that's pretty bad too. And when people say that to me, I kind of feel like saying, well, is that the Holy Spirit or is that just your comfort zone talking? Right? Is that really the Holy Spirit? Or is so what we've done is we made this classification of saying, oh, this is the Holy Spirit. Now, quick note, spiritual gifts are need-oriented. They manifest when encountered by two parts. Two parts. A willing participant, straw, we, you know what I'm talking about, but I'll unpack it in a second for those of you who are new, and a need the Holy Spirit wants to meet. Right? So the analogy I give to about the Holy Spirit, how he wants to work in us, is pre previous to how the Holy Spirit works, we have this idea that the Holy Spirit makes us a battery. This is not an endorsement for Duracell. We don't have any, uh, any, uh, any uh, um, uh, we don't get any money kickbacks from Duracell. Previous to this, Christians think of themselves as a spiritual battery. How this, here's how the spiritual battery works. I wake up in the morning, I fill myself with the power of the Holy Spirit, I go out in the world and I exude that, spirit, that power of the Holy Spirit in the world. Now, for any of you who've ever thought that, how disappointed are you when that doesn't happen? My guess is, completely. And you know what happens? If you have that understanding and God doesn't work the way you think he does, what's the next question you think? Maybe I'm too sinful. Maybe I don't have enough faith. Maybe God's not real. Maybe this world and all we think about it, it's not what's happening. And the reason you can think that is because if you think yourself as a, whole, as a spiritual battery, then a spiritual battery, like my Duracells, should be able to exude power at any point in time it's asked for it. And the analogy I like to use instead for uh, how the Holy Spirit works for us is a straw. And the reason I like the straw better is because the straw is an empty container that merely directs the contents when they're available. If I gave you a cup and I gave you a straw and the cup was empty, you could suck on that thing all day long. You're not getting anything. Kind of makes sense, right? So who are you in the scenario? You're the straw. When can you suck up anything that's in there? When there's something in there? Whose choice is that? It's the Holy Spirit's. What does he want? He just wants you to be available. And the qu other note, too, is the different sizes of the straw. Right? So when we first start working and living in the Holy Spirit, we're at the number three there. Right? We're, we're, we're like the... Uh, the stir sticks, the straws, or use the, you know, those, those two things, like, like you're trying to get the coffee. That's what we are at the very beginning. But what we really want to do is get to number 15, or just bigger, right? What we really want is the Holy Spirit to just expand us and to grow us in the Holy Spirit working through us, right? So when we think about the Holy Spirit, we have to get this an analogy of the, of, the, of the battery out of our minds, is we have to ask ourselves, all I want to do is be a straw. And the straw simply is aware that the straw is only an empty container that directs the spirit as the spirit would lead. So as you go out in the world, you interact, you can pray, you can ask, but you actually have to have a faith and a reliance upon the Holy Spirit. As a pastor, whenever I get asked for someone, someone comes to and says, you know, pastor, would you pray for healing? It's a great prayer. There's nothing wrong with that. It's completely biblical. But I tend to say something like this at the very beginning. And I say this in the prayer, hopefully that the person's hearing me. Spirit of God, we pray for healing for this individual, for this particular circumstance. But Lord, we also know too that we don't know what your will is in this. And so God, instead, we just ask that your will would be done in this moment in the situation. And the reason I simply say that is because I don't know what the Spirit's going to do. I've told you stories of, of times I have prayed for people and 
healing actually took place, and I was more surprised than anybody else. But I've also told you times of two of when I've prayed and nothing's happened. I'm just a straw. I, got, I, don't, I don't know what's going on. I just am faithful and obedient and allow the Holy Spirit to do whatever is next. So we talk about this idea of gifts in the Spirit. You've seen this diagram before, and we're almost done here. Is when we talk about the fruit of the Spirit, what we need to understand is the fruit of the Spirit is internal. What the Holy Spirit's trying to do is he's trying to internally transform us into Jesus. And all the characteristics that Christ had, that's what the Spirit's trying to give us in, internally. The gifts of the Spirit, this is the external working of the Holy Spirit. Right? But the anchor point for the Holy Spirit is not speaking in tongues. It's not any of these things. It's Jesus. I've said this before. I'll say it again. The most spiritual person I know on the planet is my mentor, Dr. Ron Kidd. He's 70 plus years old. He's smart as a day is long. But that's not what Dr. Kidd means to me. He is the most humble servant of God that I've ever met. Fully empowered by the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, he taught pneumatology, doctrine of the Holy Spirit to me in Bible college. But he is a man that has gone to the Vatican to talk to cardinals about the Holy Spirit. He is a man who left the Pentecostals and went to become an Anglican. He is a man who writes papers, goes to China to research early Christianity in China. He has more letters after his name than anybody that I've ever met. There isn't a book that I can mention to him. When I mentioned N.T. Wright, he goes, oh, Tom, yeah, I was talking to Tom the other day. You know N.T. Wright? Can I, can, can I get it on that call? Like, like, like how, like, that's not what's important about Dr. Kidd to me. He is as humble and as spirit-filled. He will serve anyone at any moment in time. And he's in his 70s. Don't you feel like he deserves a break? Like, like whenever I meet with Dr. Kidd, it's not as often as I would like. Dr. Kidd, what are you doing? What are you doing right now? Oh, I'm, I'm speaking at this conference. I've written this paper. I'm, I'm researching this right now. Y you know, Dr. Kidd, that you retired like 20 years ago, right? But see, in the Spirit of God, in the kingdom of heaven, you don't retire. No matter how young you are or how old you are, you don't retire. Why? The only time the Holy Spirit is done with you is when you take your last breath. Then the Spirit's like, okay, my work's done. That's when you're done with the Holy Spirit, right? And that's what Dr. Kidd means to me. He said this again, and I'll say it again to you. The most spirit-filled people resemble Jesus. This is why the last two years of the pandemic, what, what has taken place has been so atrocious, is because there's been so much unchristlike behavior that has come out of Christians. And honestly, when I encounter individuals who ask me about this, all I can say is, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Like, I, like whatever your stance is on this, I, I, like again, I'm so sorry. The most spirit-filled people resemble Jesus, and I need you to understand that. Francis Chan, in his incredible book, On the Holy Spirit, Forgotten God, says this. If it's true that the Spirit of God dwells in us and that our bodies are the Holy Spirit's temple, then shouldn't there be a huge difference between the person who has the Spirit of God living inside of him or her and then the person who does not? Honestly, like, like mic drop right there. If we as Christ followers within the church, within the kingdom of heaven, have the Holy Spirit, the creative force of the universe living in us and through us, shouldn't there be something freaking different about us? Shouldn't there be something different about us? Like, like, like this is something that haunts me as a pastor. It's haunt me as a, it haunts me as a Christian as well, too. Because I always ask myself, because surprise, surprise, I get tired. I get frustrated. I get down on myself. I, get, I have all these things. I'm anxious. I can be frustrated. All these things are true of myself as well, too. And you're like, Pastor, that we know. But isn't there something be that, that, that supersedes that? Isn't there something more, the, an internal engine that's beyond that, transcendent to that? Let me close. Remember I told you John chapters 14, 15, and 16 are kind of Jesus' high priestly prayer about the Holy Spirit? What's interesting is you break down these three chapters. Jesus says something kind of interesting, and I'll give you a couple of verses to kind of frame it for you. So in John chapter 14, what Jesus says, he starts off the conversation by saying this. If you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, the Holy Spirit. Now, I've said this before. Whenever the Bible uses an if-then statement, what's really important, what the emphasis is supposed to be, is there it is incumbent upon us to obey. Right? 
And so one of the reasons why Paul doesn't get to the Holy Spirit till chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, because honestly, he probably should start at the very beginning, is because he's got to go through their obedience first. Because they're not obeying. See, if we disobey, or if we are fighting against God, the Holy Spirit can do very little with us. So in John chapter 14, before Jesus gets to this high priestly teaching on the Holy Spirit, he says, listen, before you can have the advocate, you have to obey my commandments. And it's not negotiate with me, but it's obey. Now in John chapter 15, look what he says. From apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. See, what I have to realize, what I have to understand is no matter what I do for you as a pastor, it doesn't matter how many hours I spend on my sermon, it doesn't matter how many hours I spend organizing, getting things going at UCC, without Jesus, I can do nothing. Everything that I do is garbage without Jesus. And as a pastor, it's kind of horrifying. It's kind of horrifying if you think about it. I spend, I don't know, 20, 25 hours on each sermon. Really, I can only spend, if, if I could just spend like five minutes, you're welcome, I don't. But I could spend five minutes, and if, if the Holy Spirit takes that and, and uses that, that's equivalent to my 25. Right? It just, it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. Apart from Jesus, I can do nothing. There isn't a negotiation. There isn't a loophole. Apart from Jesus, from apart from me, you can do nothing. I don't know about you, but that is as simple and as horrifying as I can think of. Whatever I do in my life as a Christ follower, apart from Jesus, I can do nothing. Now look at John chapter 16. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. What does the Holy Spirit want to do? He wants to make us like Jesus. How does that make us give Jesus glory? Because we, his, his followers, the word Christian comes from the church in Antioch. It means little Christ. It started off as a derogatory term to describe Christians. But Christians back in the first century, they're different than the Christians today. They take an insult and they make it their label. Oh, you Christian, you little Jesuses. Little Jesus. Yeah, I like that. I'm a little Jesus. They take an insult and they make it their label. Right? And what does he say? He will bring me glory. Who's he? The Spirit. How you live your life, how you behave, how you think, how you act, whatever, how, however you live out your faith, You are going to bring either glory or shame to Jesus by the way you act. That's the fruit. That's the crops. That's all that Jesus is talking about. And the Holy Spirit, if you allow, if you allow, he wants to do more in your life than you can hope, dream, or imagine. But see, we believe, as what N.T. Wright said, is that, oh yeah, Jesus died on the cross. He saved me from my sins. That's it. And the Spirit's like, no. That's just the beginning of the, of the, of the adventure. Because now I've got to take those dark places in your lives, those prejudices, those, uh, those, those, those things you hold against other people, the things you hold against yourself, how you view yourself, like whether it's a, a really low self-esteem, self-loathing, whatever it might be. I've got to take all of that. I've got to transform it. Because a temple of the Holy Spirit doesn't look, act, or behave that way. And you're like, okay, fine. How long is it going to take? Oh, the rest of your life. I, I got things to do. Can, can we speed up the process? And they're like, no. Paul says to the church in Corinth, the Spirit of God gives each of us spiritual gifts. I use the word plural there because you don't have one, you have multiple. Your obedience dictates the usage of those gifts. And it's really up to you to be obedient to that. How do I be obedient to the Holy Spirit? When we taught in the series, and if you want to go back, um, I don't remember what I called it. Something missing or l spirit or fire. I don't know. Anyways, it's on our website. You can go back and you can, you can listen to it. But I gave you, I, I gave in that series the Holy Spirit prayer. Remember I told you what the Holy Spirit prayer is? Every day you wake up in the morning, you take time to pray, and you pray this simple thing. Holy Spirit, as I go throughout my day, bring me an awareness of God's presence, bring me an awareness of needs that I can meet, and help me to glorify Jesus today. You're like, wow, how's that? All you're doing is giving God space. All you're doing is giving His Holy Spirit permission to interrupt your day. And 
he will. And it will be inconvenient. And it will cost you something. That's why we resist the Spirit. Comfort resists the Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to work in us. He wants to work through our church. He wants to work through our lives. We as a church, we want to be a place where the Spirit of God moves, dwells, transforms, changes. And we don't rely upon anything for that. We just simply rely upon the Holy Spirit. Again, I think back to the Ugandan woman that I met many, many years ago. I just have faith in the Spirit. I just have faith in God. And I think to myself, oh, Lord, please help me to have that kind of faith just to believe that that's possible for us today, right here, right now. Let's pray. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. Not going to make you do anything. I do just want you to have a moment of reflection. I just want you to think. As I asked you at the beginning, what's your spiritual gift? But really, I could be more accurate to say, how is the Spirit of God using you? And the answer could be he's not, or I'm not sure. I'm not sure is a great conversation, a great awareness of the Spirit through our lives. He's not is an acknowledgement that you are resisting him in some way, shape, or form. You all are given spiritual gifts. The reason you're, done, you're, you're, you're given that is, as again, going back to verse 2, to help each other, to care for one another, to let the world see the glory that is Christ in and through us by our obedience. And so my challenge to you this morning is not to go through your day thinking to yourself, it's other people's responsibility to do this, but instead accepting that Christ in you, through you, by the power of the Holy Spirit will change and transform you. And when we, once we grasp a hold of that one idea, then there's nothing the Spirit of God can't do through us. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you that you have not left us as spiritual orphans. I thank you that you have not left us defenseless. But Lord, you have given us the power of the Holy Spirit. And oh Jesus, please forgive us for not taking that seriously enough. Please forgive us for not wrapping our mind upon the implications of what that looks like. Lord, for those of us in this room, and I definitely include myself in this, for those of us perhaps resist your spirit throughout the day, resist your prompting, your voice, I pray, God, that you would help us. You would soften us, give us a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit's voice. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would also transform us internally as well, too. You would give us the fruit of the Spirit, just continue that acceleration of growth within us. Lord, we place ourselves fully and completely before you, and we ask that, Holy Spirit, you would fill us to overflowing, that we would be a straw, but a wide straw, that when you choose, however you choose, whenever you choose, that, Lord, we would be faithful and willing to be used of you, through you, by you, and also despite us in that conversation. Spirit of the Most High God, please speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen.